if you will, take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. It's good to see you this week after we had such a huge day last week. We, uh, uh, God has been good to us. And my one, my one cry is that, Lord, don't let us waste the opportunities that you give us. Romans 12. You just, I want you to hold there. I promise you, I will get to it. On the screen, you see a picture of Noah's Ark. Have you ever considered how that family, how Noah and his family must have felt when God lowered the gangplank and let them out after a year? Have you ever thought about how they felt? I mean, when you think of all they had been through. I mean, they went through almost 100 years of building this massive ark. Now, if you don't remember this ark, let me just give you some dimensions. 450 feet long. You realize that's a football field and a half. 75 feet high with three decks, three levels. 48 to 50 foot wide. It's a monstrosity. It's like they had built a hotel. And they went through 100 years of building this, and then the family could likely remember that almost magical day. Can you put yourself there? When the animals begin to come, two by two, the unclean animals, seven pair by seven pair, the clean animals, and they seemed to know exactly where to go. It was almost like God was in charge. And then God told them to get their belongings and their rations and things and go on to the ark. And when they got on the ark, God closed the door. Hello. They were on the ark for seven days. Nothing happened. I want you to get this. They're in this monstrosity of a house. They didn't know what a boat was. They didn't know what an ark was. It was a monstrosity of a house, seven days. Chances are in seven days there were some fumes and odors. I'm thinking, what have I gotten myself into? And then all of a sudden they heard this sound they'd never heard before. They saw a light that they'd never seen before, thundering and lightning. And all of a sudden they felt they could hear something pattering on this big building. Rain? They didn't know what it was. I've wondered this, Eric. I've wondered if... If Noah did a really good job on the top side, or if maybe when that rain started falling, there were some leaks in there, and they're thinking, oh, no, what's going to happen now? It rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained for over six weeks, close to six weeks. It rained. Somewhere along there, I want you to think about this. You're in this big house. You really, really don't know what it's all about. But you know, there's a lot of water falling. You can hear it outside. And all of a sudden, this big old monstrosity of a house moves a little bit. No offense, ladies, but I can imagine those four women going, Oh! And it moves them some more. And then it lifts up. They didn't know anything about buoyancy. And it lifted up. And it, lit, and it crashed around with the waves. Can you imagine being in there? When God lowered the gangplank, they had been in the ark over a year. Can you imagine how they felt when finally, I know they let, let out ravens and doves, I understand all of this, but can you imagine when God lowered the gangplank and those eight people walked out, probably birds flying over their head. I can imagine some of them hit their knees and kissed the earth because they never thought they'd ever see it again. And we don't know all that happened there. But I want to bring your attention to what Noah did. It's found, you just stay Romans 12, but I want to put this on the screen for you. Genesis 8:20. then Noah built an altar to the Lord. He took some of every kind of clean animal and every kind of clean bird 
and offered burnt offerings on the, say it with me, altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing, some translations say the sweet aroma, he said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of human beings. Get this next statement. Even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. Y'all don't be mad at me, I didn't say it. From youth onward. And I will never strike down every living thing, never again strike down every little thing as I have done. First thing Noah did was he built an altar to say thanks to the Lord. He offered a sacrifice. It became a pleasing, a sweet aroma to God in the nostrils of God. That means he gained God's favor. The title of this message today, I know I've put the blank. He's going to put it up here. The title of this message today is The Altar. The Altar. Now, we don't know exactly what it looks like. I gave you four shots there, perhaps one of them. It doesn't really matter what it looked like. He built an altar to say, thank you, God. And when he did this, and when he did the burnt offering thing, it went up into God's nostrils with that sweet aroma, so much so that God made this covenant. It's called the Noahic Covenant. This covenant with the world. He put a rainbow in the sky. If you read chapter 8 on further down, he put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder. But from man's view, please listen, everything started at Noah's altar. Today we want to talk about that altar. The altar is a place in the Bible The altar is a place in history. The altar has a place in church buildings. And the altar has a place in our heart and our lives. The altar is a place where we meet with God, where we become personally intimate with God. Too many people have this abstract vision of who God is and don't know him intimately enough. I want to kind of walk through this today and help us gain a fresh new vision of the altar. Who built altars? I mean, was this a one-time deal? No. Do you realize that everybody in the Old Testament of any notoriety that you can name likely built an altar? Start with Noah, go to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Balak, Moses, Gideon, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon. We could go on and on. And additionally, when God gave out plans for the tabernacle, you know what he did? He put an altar in the center of it. Exodus 27, 1 says, you are to construct the, say it with me, altar of acacia wood. The altar must be square, seven feet long, seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet tall. Altars were built in both the tabernacle and the temple. It's like God said, when you build these buildings, I want you to put me center stage. Throughout Scripture, altars were built in the lives of people to connect them with God for the purpose of pleasing God, for the purpose of knowing God. Now, you can move that forward if you will. I want you to notice this. The altar is not a pretty place. The altar is not a pristine place. It's not the place, if you were in England, that you would go and get coffee and crumpets, or in America you'd get coffee and donuts. It's not that place where you go to socialize. It is the place where you meet God. Just Friday I was playing golf with a friend, a preacher friend. We're talking about the things of the going on in the world. And he reiterated what you've heard me say before. He said there's a little hope for this country outside of a great revival inside the church 
and a great awakening, spiritual awakening, outside the church. And it happens at the altar. It's a place of thanksgiving. It's a place of repentance. It's a place of restoration. It's a place of submission. It's essential. Without an altar, please listen. Without an altar, you've never had an encounter with God. That simple. So now we get to the New Testament. I've asked you to turn to Romans 12. As Paul writes to the church at Rome, all those Roman Christians, he has just, he has just completed singing a song of praise. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Eric, ladies. Singing songs of praise and worship. He says, all oh, the depth, the white, the width of God's love, the majesty of God. And then he says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, now I understand that I'm reading for the Christian Standard Version, and you're, some of you are reading for the King James or other versions. King James says, I beseech you therefore. See, therefore is still there. I beseech you therefore. When, there, when the word therefore is found, we need to find out what it is there for. Therefore, brothers and sisters, this is a family thing. In view of of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Would you bow and pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we hear your word today, I pray that we hear your voice. And I pray that you don't let any of us off with our excuses. I pray that this, that this building becomes a holy place where you occupy. I pray that this that our hearts become holy places that you occupy. Speak, because we are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the altar, we have to understand the importance of it. No matter what your view has been, there is a message in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, for you today. I know this because I've wrestled with this for two weeks. If we're going to understand the importance of the altar, the importance of our lives before Christ, we just have to unpack this verse and the best way I know to unpack it is with five words that I believe God's revealed to me from this verse. The first word is the word passion. Passion. Can you hear it in Paul's voice? He says, my translation says, I urge you. King James says, I beseech you. It means that, that I appeal to you. I plead with you. I beg you. It's passionate. It's the same word that was used in, in Matthew 8 when the centurion came to Jesus and begged Jesus to come and heal his son. It's the same word that was used a little later in that chapter when Jesus was in Gadara and he healed the man and put the demons in the pig and they came out and they begged him to leave the area. It's the same word that we find in Mark 1 when the leper came up to Jesus and begged him to heal him. Can you hear the emotion? Can you sense how emotional they were begging him? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. This translation says, in view of the mercies. Some say, in light 
of the mercies. Well, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means in, in view of everything that's holy, in view of everything that you think God is, in view of it all, I am begging you. Today your pastor stands here to make a beg to you. To hear, to heed the passion of the pill made by the Apostle Paul. Passion. Second word is the word present. I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to present. That means to bring it near. That means to bring it close. That means to offer it completely. That means to take your hands off of it. That means to make it available. You think about it in the Old Testament. That's exactly what was done. You brought your offering, you gave your offering, and you turned it over to God. Do I need to repeat that, brothers and sisters? You brought yourself, you gave yourself, and you turned it over to God. Paul says, I beg you, present yourself. Present your bodies. Now, did y'all get that? Present your bodies. Now, why in the world, Tim, did he say bodies? I don't know all the reasons, but let me give you a couple of thoughts. He wants us to present our bodies because before we knew him, we used our bodies to commit sin. Before we knew him, our bodies were our temples for our own pleasure. Once we came into his kingdom, now our bodies are not our own. It's been bought with a price. And now instead of being our temple, we are his temple. Instead of being made now for our pleasure, we are available for his pleasure. You see, he says, I beg you to present your body a living sacrifice. Now, does that strike anybody odd? Living sacrifice? Does that strike anybody odd? See, everything in the Old Testament that got sacrificed quit living. Hello? When you sacrifice something, you turn loose of it. When you sacrifice something, generally it doesn't get up off the altar. When you sacrifice something, it becomes holy to him. There's only two living sacrifices in all Scripture. Number one, in Genesis 22, in Genesis 22, Abraham took Isaac, bound him, and lay him on the altar. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you about this living sacrifice, because you know the story. You know that over in the bush was a ram, or a lamb, that replaced Isaac. But you need to hear this. Isaac willingly laid down on that altar. And you go, Brother Jerry, I don't think I, I don't think it was willingly. He bound him. Yeah, but come on, guys. No offense intended. Abraham was in his 90s. The boy was probably a teenager. Strong teenager. He could have overpowered his dad. He willingly laid his life down. And make no mistake, Abraham, would, would, if that angel hadn't caught his arm, he would have put that knife right into his heart because he believed God. He knew the boy was, a, was the one of promise, and he knew that if his son was killed, that God was powerful enough to bring him back from the dead. Living sacrifice. The other living sacrifice found in the New Testament, this is none other but Jesus Christ himself. Now, Jesus suffered the death. Jesus died, and then God brought him back from the dead. What power? And you're worried about whether God can take care of you or not? He can raise Jesus from the dead. If he can raise Jesus from the dead, he can take care of you. You see, here's the thing. Jesus was the one who knew no sin, but he became sin. That means he died in your place, in your place. That means he died in your place. He means he died for your sin, for my sin. That means he was crucified. It means he was put in the ground. 
Presenting your body. Presenting your body is a once and for all idea. You don't present your body as a living sacrifice and go, oh God, I want it back. You give it to him. It requires complete commitment of mind, body, and soul to the Lord. Hear Paul's passionate, passionate plea today. He says, I urge you, I beg you, present your body a living sacrifice, which is, oh, King James says, reasonable service. True worship. It's authentic. It's a powerful thought. You know why? Because of the third word. It's pleasing. Pleasing. Holy and pleasing to God are powerful thoughts. Holy and acceptable. You see, here's the thing. It is offering what you have, what you have deemed as holy. Whether you like it or not, you think your life is holy. And you protect it with all your might. You think your body is holy. And you protect it with all your might. When you hear this word pleasing, it dates back to Genesis 8, to Noah's altar. Noah's altar, he, he burned a sacrifice and it was accepted. It was received by God because he gave it in an attitude of thanksgiving and appreciation. And understanding about who God was and what God had done and how God had worked in his life. He sacrificed it. He burned it. Scripture says the aroma of that sacrifice, the aroma was pleasing, was soothing, was accepted, was sweet in the nostrils of God. In other words, are you listening? He found favor with God. Favor. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, is not an easy or pretty book to read. Remember when you read Malachi? That was God's last word to mankind for 400 years. And it's not pretty. Well, a man robbed God. At one point he goes, I just wish you would stop this worship stuff because you're not worshiping me. It's... It's artificial. That's the watch translation. Chapter 2 of Malachi says, Is God pleased with you? Why don't you ask him? Is he pleased with you? Why don't you ask him? Ask for his favor. Ask for his blessing. Gaining God's favor comes from pleasing God. God, which begins at the altar. The words from the, therefore, brothers and sisters, the passion I urge you, present, to present your body as a living sacrifice, the pleasing, holy, and acceptable, and the plan, the fourth word is the plan. This is your true worship. This is your reasonable service. Are you getting that? Which is your true worship? The only way you worship is to present your body a living sacrifice. True worship, reasonable service. When you're saved, when Jesus is living in your heart, When Jesus is living in your heart, the way that you worship is give him all that you are. We miss today what real worship is. Maybe we get close sometimes. Worship is more than just singing a few songs, saying a few prayers, having a good experience and listening to a Bible message. Too often we come into a service like this and we focus on the wrong things. 
But the four things I just mentioned, few, uh, singing a few songs, saying a few prayers, having a good experience, listening to a Bible message. Today, the emphasis seems to be on the good experience. If we have a good experience, it'll be okay. Well, here's the problem. H.B. Charles, pastor in Florida, made this statement. He said, when the church is mainly watered down to having good experiences, then we can't be surprised when people walk away once they've had a bad one. You see, folks, true worship, reasonable service, begins in the heart. It's a matter of the heart, and it's the heart of the matter. You see, if you've trusted Jesus, if Jesus has come into your life and changed you, and I want to say, you don't ask Jesus in your heart to be saved. Jesus comes in your heart because you get saved. He takes up residence. And then when you try to go back and sin again, you know what happens? He knocks you on the, on the door and he goes, oh, you, you don't want to do that anymore. Because I'm with you now. I'll help you now. It's your reasonable service. It's your, it's your reasonable worship. It's your authentic worship. It's your expected worship. It's your natural worship because it's your act of devotion. The last word that comes to my mind as I unpack that is the word personal. Personal. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. But it's me. Please listen. We hear a message like this, and we'll go, yeah, he got them over there. They were over there. Yeah, they'd have been here. They'd have gotten you in. Listen, you are here, and he's got us. He's calling on us. When we look at somebody else, all it is is a defense mechanism to keep us from accepting and responding to our own calling from God. Paul tried to extend this powerful, passionate invitation, and he says, I beseech you, I urge you, I plead with you, I beg you. You see, folks, it's not just me. It's not just Eric. It's not just Donald. It's every one of us. This is personal. And today you make the choice. And yes, as we do so often, we make a choice to do nothing and walk out of here because we think life is going gonna, is gonna to be the same forever. I have to tell you, I'm reading and studying the book of the Revelation right now. You might want to get a fresh glimpse of what's ahead and who you want to know. Paul says, in view of everything, in light of everything that's holy before God, understanding his mercies, understanding his grace, thanking him for all of his gifts, I beseech you. I appeal to you, I beg you. Come to the altar. Present your body a sacrifice. Don't grab your purse. Don't shift in your seat. We're not through. I want to remind you, you say, we seem, not you, we seem to respond to musical messages. Tate, I didn't ask you to do this, but would you turn the lights down, please? I want you to I really ask for, from this point to the end, I'm going to ask that you not move, that you just pay attention. And I want you to hear the words to this song.
the altar. I declare to you from the bottom of my heart we have forgotten what the altar is for. We have forgotten what the altar is. So as I end this, I want to give you four or five things for you to think about. First of all, I would tell you that the, the altar is a special place. A special place. There's not another place like the altar on earth. Do you know why? Because it's a sacred place. It's a holy place. It's a place where you find the Lord. It's a place where you meet God. It's a place where you discover Jesus. It's a holy place. But it's also, it's also a place of submission. Up to now it's been okay, but Brother Jerry's submission, I don't know about, we don't, I'm not submitting to anybody. Well, let me just ease your mind. Ephesians 1 tells us that everything's already been put under Jesus. So if you submit to Jesus, you're just going to the place where God put you. And by the way, if you take your troubles and your struggles and your heartaches and your heartache and your hurt and your questions and you put them under Jesus, remember this, he's on top of things. It's the altar. Not only is it a place of submission, it's a place of surrender. I don't want to surrender to anybody. Well, yeah, you do. You might want to surrender whatever's going on. Because if you surrender, it's somebody else's problem. I want to paint you a picture about something. You, you think about this thing of surrender. I know we've got some law enforcement people in here. But you take law enforcement people. They find a criminal. They find him in a house. They circle the house. And they get on their bullhorn. And they say, come out with your hands up. That's surrender. I'll get in trouble here. That's fine. But I'm going to get in trouble on the Bible. You know, there's something that's bothered me ever since before I was here the first time, Debbie. Why it is that Baptists are so reticent, refuse to raise their hands before the Lord. Well, that's a Pentecostal thing. Well, let me tell you, Paul must have been Pentecostal because he wrote to Timothy. And after he said, you know what? For this reason, for the gospel, I was appointed an apostle, a teacher. And when he said that, then he said, therefore, I want men to pray everywhere. Lifting holy hands. Oh, he put something else on that, men. Without anger or argument. Surrender. It's kind of like, daddy, when you're a child. Place of surrender. It's a place of submission. It's a sacred place. It's also a place of salvation and sacrifice. We're just going to stop at sacrifice for a second. Sacrifice. Do you think God's going to make you sacrifice away something that's for your good? If you do, then you don't trust him. Hello? It's a place where you bring your body and you present it to the altar. It's a place where you bring your sins and bring them to the altar. It's a place where you bring your struggles to the altar. Sacrifice them. Present them to him. And then it's a place of salvation. If you have never trusted Christ... If you, you can have been a church member for 60 years. But you know in here, you're living like everybody else. You can bring your unbelief. You can bring your questions. You can bring your hopelessness. You can bring your helplessness. You can bring your need to him. And you put it on the altar. And he'll take care of it.